as the title indicated, I'm going to be trying to make a manchego cheese. Um, it's a Spanish cheese. I have traveled quite a bit and spent a fair amount of time in Spain. Sounds strange to say I think I might have eaten it. I'm not sure. Uh, I eat many different times. I have had uh, a cheese uh, sandwich, like uh, we'd call it a sub here. It's a bocadillo in Spain. And various different kinds of cheeses were in it. They were always delicious, but I really didn't know the name of them. Traditionally, uh, when they're well, even now when they make it in Spain, they use this exact same mold. This is a Spanish mold. But traditionally, it was bound with uh, braided straw or grass, which left uh, an imprint on the sides of it. And that's what this band is here. If you can see inside of there, it sort of has the imprint of what would be like braided uh, grass. And that goes down inside of the mold uh, before you put the curd in. This is the follower and it also has a design on it and the same design is on the bottom of the mold. I can't give you a link to the exact recipe that I'm using um, because it doesn't exist. I've read two different recipes online and I'll put links to both of those below the YouTube video on the YouTube channel anyway. If you're watching this on the blog it won't be there but you can go to the YouTube channel and find it. I'm, I've read and using parts of both of those, plus uh, the cheese recipe book that I have has a different recipe again. There are similarities among all three recipes, but there are things that are, are different, and I've sort of picked and chose what I thought I would like to try. So let's move on here and uh, get started making a manchego cheese. By the way, the name, uh, I think it's La Mancha, the area of Spain where the cheese originates and it's called the Manchego cheese because of the breed of sheep that they raise for the milk. Uh, they are the Manchego sheep so that's where the that's where the uh, the cheese gets its name and it is traditionally made with ewe's milk, uh, sheep milk. Mine's going to be made with cow's milk, commercially bought in whole cow's milk um, no way possible I'd ever be able to get used milk here anywhere. I'd love to be able to try it. Let's move on and uh, start the process. Well, I'm using four gallons of milk, um, close to 16 liters. And now it's time to acetify the milk and add the cultures. A uh, half teaspoon of calcium chloride mixed in with a quarter cup of what for me is tap water. If you don't have water, my tap water is just from the well, so there's no chlorine or anything. Probably you should use a, a bottled spring water if you have city water. And this is at 72 degrees uh, because I'm using two cultures, mesophilic and thermophilic both. And they both uh, ferment and work at different temperatures. So the suggestion from one of the sites that I was looking at was to do your fermentation at, at two different temperatures. 72 for 20 minutes to a half hour and then increase the temperature to 86 and let it go for another half hour or so. That was the mesophilic, a quarter teaspoon of mesophilic. And for the thermophilic, I'm using these little sachets, which have more bulk in them than, uh, than a quarter teaspoon, but there isn't that much of the culture in there, so I'm using two of these packets for four gallons of milk. Now I'll let this hydrate on the surface for a few minutes and then I'll mix it in and let it set for 20 minutes 
I'll bring you back at that time. Well, it's had its 20 minutes at 72, and I've just turned the heat back on. I'm bringing it up to 86. Once it reaches 86, I will let it rest for another 30 minutes. So I'll bring you back at that time. It has finished the ripening stage. And now I'm going to add a half teaspoon of lipase powder dissolved in a quarter of a cup of cold tap water. Lipase is an enzyme. Uh, the one that I'm using comes from the pancreas of a lamb or sheep. I'm not sure if there is a vegetarian or vegan variety out there that comes from some other source or not. I'm not so sure that mine's going to work very well. I noticed on the package that it says it's best used within eight months, and I know I've had it longer than eight months. don't know what I bought it for. I never did use it. It's used in some of the Italian cheeses, provolone, and uh, Pecorino Romano uh, to enhance the, the flavor of that type of cheese. Romano is also made with ewe's milk, so I suppose that's why one of these recipes suggested to add it to this. If it is a little on the weak side, it won't hurt anything, I guess. And now I'm going to add the rennet. It's a half teaspoon of rennet, once again in a quarter of a cup of cold water. I'll mix that in thoroughly for a minute or two here and then I let it set for 30 minutes and it's supposed to produce a relatively soft curd so that's why only a half teaspoon of rennet. I'm using a 1% solution animal rennet. So, we'll come back in 30 minutes time and hopefully we have a curd formed. Well, it's had its 30 minutes, now I'll check to see if it's giving me a clean break or not here. I don't know if I can call that a clean break. No, I think I'll give it another 10 minutes or so. Well, it's had an additional 10 minutes. It's still quite a soft curd, but I'm going to go with it because the recipe said it would be a soft curd, I guess. I'm going to do my usual thing here if you've watched my cheese videos before. I'll make all the cuts across this way, turn this, and go all the way across this way. In relatively small, uh, half inch or smaller, wide slices. This particular curd, at the, at the end of the cooking process, the curd particles are supposed to be the size of a grain of rice or a grain of uh, barley or whatever. Very small, but that's when you've finished the cooking process. But it does get cut into very small pieces. I'll bring you back when I have done the cross hatch here. Now to break up the curd down below, I use a wire whisk. After each revolution, I just go down a little further. What I don't think I have mentioned so far in this video, in case you're somebody that's been watching this for the first time, to heat the milk, I have it in a hot water bath an old enamel canner with my stainless steel five gallon pot here down inside of it. So I increase the temperature of the, the water and that brings up the temperature of the milk without having to worry about scorching it or burning it on the bottom. And all of the equipment has been sanitized. A lot of people use boiling water I use a dairy sanitizer, the same as is used in a, in a commercial dairy. I buy it from a cheese making supply company, same company that I buy, bought the mold from, New England Cheese Company. I like that because you don't have to fool around with hot water. You mix, I mix it up in this five gallon pot. 
and everything just has to be dipped in it and then left to air dry. Well, now that I've done that part of the cutting, it now is allowed to settle for five minutes. So I just started my timer. I'll come back in five minutes time. Well, they've had their five minutes to settle and as you can see they've gone down below the way a certain amount anyway. Now for the next five minutes you gently stir in an up and down motion using the whisk and that will further break up some of the larger pieces of curd. The purpose of the first five minute rest there, it says, is to heal the curd. The edges where you had cut the curd so that when you start this process you don't lose the butter fat from the curd or at least you don't lose as much of it out into the whey. So I'll bring you back after the five minutes of gently stirring like this. Well, I have been stirring gently with the whisk for five minutes and now the next process is the cooking process which will further dry out the curd and get the gas going under here. Over about a 40 minute, 40 to 50 minute period we gently raise the temperature to 98 degrees Fahrenheit between 98 degrees Fahrenheit and 102 degrees Fahrenheit the higher temperature will produce a drier curd and it is recommended if you're like me just starting out on this that you um, don't go for such a dry curd at a high temperature the lower temperature uh, is okay for a cheese that you're not going to age for a long period of time and I only intend to age this for the minimum um, which is two months you can age it for much longer periods of time, but you should be using a, a drier curd at that time. So, I'm going to try to get it up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'll bring you back at that point. And what I didn't say, I guess, is that the temperature should be raised very slowly over that 40 to 50 minutes. It says no more than 3 degrees Fahrenheit every five minutes so you don't want to zoom right up to that hundred degrees well over 40 minutes it took exactly the 40 minutes to get it up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit most of the curds as you can see are relatively small some are the size that they say they're supposed to be and others appear to be a bit larger there is a test that you can do at this stage to see whether or not it's ready. I'm going to attempt it. I just washed my hands. I have very clean hands. Take some in your hand and squeeze it. It forms a clump. And if it breaks apart easily with your thumb, uh, I guess that's what that's doing. <laughs> I've done the test and I still don't know for sure. But yeah, that is sort of breaking it apart into the small small curds is what it's supposed to do quite easily with your thumb. So I'll say that that's ready. I'm going to let it settle now for five minutes before I take off the whey. So I'll bring you back at that point. Well, I'm about to attempt pouring off most of the whey or all of it, hopefully. Uh, the setup that I have here, I have a larger stainless steel, not larger than the one I just used, but a large stainless steel uh, stock pot that I used to use to make cheese, but I think it only holds three gallons or something like that, and I like making a four gallon cheese, so I've, I've gone up to a bigger stock pot. And inside of that I have a stainless steel colander, and that's lined with a small piece of cheesecloth just so the smaller curds that might come out with the whey won't get lost down into the whey. I'm saving the whey this time. I want to use part of it tomorrow. I'm going to make a, a, a sourdough bread and instead of water I'm going to use whey in it and see how that goes. I've made bread before with whey but not a sourdough bread so that's going to be tomorrow's experiment with at least part of the whey here. 
And this piece of cheesecloth I'm also going to use to line the mold. Uh, it's not as large as I would normally use in lining a mold. Uh, some sites and some recipes say with that cheese mold that I'm using, the Spanish Manchego mold, that you don't need to add cheesecloth. But I watched a video yesterday that was made in a factory in Spain where they make Manchego and they were using these same molds and their first pressing they were putting a piece of cheesecloth in. They didn't say why. My only thought on it is that it might prevent the small curds from blocking up the little holes in the mold where the whey is supposed to come out. And they only do two pressings and that's what I'm going to do. One lighter pressing and one well, not still a heavy pressing, but one moderate pressing for a longer period of time. So the f <laughs> I'm going to attempt to get this thing back out of that mold and flip it. Whether that will be successful or not, we'll see in a few minutes. And I think I will now pour off the way. Good idea, but it's not staying up where I wanted it to. Just have to pour a bit slower, I guess. going to be a slow process. I'll show you the finished product. One of the main problems I guess that I was having is that smaller colander, a uh, smaller stock pot was already full. I've managed to pour off most of it and the curd has gone into a larger mass in the bottom of the stock pot which is what it was supposed to do. So I'm bringing it in there in chunks last little bit I'll pour back through again with some whey. I'll bring you back when I have that finished. Well, the mold is really full, which is good, because they said with cow's milk you wouldn't get as much solids as you would if you had used uh, used milk. So, I realize there's a lot of whey to be pressed out of there yet, but nevertheless it's quite solid, quite full rather. And the piece of cheesecloth that I'm using is just big enough. I don't want to get a lot in there. Well, I will get the follower on that and get it in the cheese press and show you that in just a minute. Well, it's in the cheese press for 15 minutes at 15 pounds, or roughly 15 pounds of pressure. I'm trying to show you the, the mold in the press as well as the, the whey leaving here, if you can see that or not, but the whey is running out of it quite readily. And after 15 minutes, I'll attempt to flip it. I'll bring you back at that point. Well, it's had its 15 minutes at 15 pounds. Here goes the death-defying feat of trying to get it out of there. I managed to raise the edge of the liner thing. Cheese is not coming out with it. First, then I guess. I need to break it up. Okay. Now, I think I have a method in my head as to how I'm going to do this, but 
we'll see. You can already see the design, or can you see it? What are you looking at there? Yeah, you can already see the design on the side, and hopefully, doing it this way and putting it back in, you'll never get it lined up right, but this, the curd is still soft enough that uh, it should just make the design again. Now what I'm doing here, I am going to flip it, but I want to put it back in this before I flip it. The bottom of it looks quite nice. The put together so that's good I guess. Hope I'm not completely blocking your view. I'm trying to wrestle this thing back together. That's better. Now I will put it back in the press. What to do with the follower? follower just goes on top, this time no cheesecloth, and it gets pressed at 20 to 25 pounds pressure for 7 to 8 hours. So I'll show it to you back in the press anyway, and then we'll have to wait 7 or 8 hours to see what it looks like when it finishes. It's back in the press at about 25 pounds pressure. You have to keep adjusting it for the first couple of hours or so, because as it presses out more way, this kind of cheese press loses some of the pressure. After that, it's, uh, once it's you know, expelled about all the way that it's going to expel, it uh, stays at the pressure that you leave it at and just continues to consolidate the curd. But there we are so far. So far I guess I'm pleased. It didn't fall apart and I managed to get it back in there after taking it out of the cheesecloth. So I will bring you back when it has finished this pressing. Well, it's had seven hours in the press, and now it sets out overnight still in the mold. And the next phase after this is brining it. And I'm going to use the brine that I made with my last cheese that I made, the herbed Gouda cheese, a couple of weeks ago or so. It's, a brine is good for several cheeses. And what I've done with that, I've put it in a stainless steel stock pot and brought it to a boil just in case there's something living in there that you wouldn't want on your cheese and I'll let it cool overnight so when I'm ready to take this out of the mold in the morning it'll be ready to go in the brine so we'll see what it looks like in the morning it has rested overnight now I will try to get it out of the mold That came out clean anyway, didn't bring any of the cheese with it. Ah, here we go. see the braided design around there. Uh, if you can also notice this lip of cheese on the top, that is normal according to the instructions uh, and you don't remove it or at least it can be removed easier after the cheese has been brined. So I will be brining it next and I'll remove that when it comes out of the brine but let's get the brine out and start that process. I just weighed it and it is one ounce short of four pounds, so that's a, a good weight. I weighed it because the instructions say to brine it for three to four hours per pound 
of the finished cheese here. So I'm going to go with three hours and uh, per pound, that'll, for all intents and purposes, we'll say 12 hours, I guess. Floating high as it's supposed to. I've never tried, but I suspect if you put it in just straight water, it probably would not float. It's the heavy brine solution that causes it to float. And you're supposed to sprinkle a teaspoon or two of salt over the top. Halfway through the brining, I will flip it and do the same again with cheese, with the cheese, yeah, with salt on the top. Um, the salt I'm using is the one that I bought from the cheese supply company that they're calling cheese salt, but you could use any non-iodized pure salt, uh, pickling salt, kosher salt, all those good things. So I'll bring you back in 12 hours time when it comes out of the brine. Well, the cheese is still in the brine, actually another two hours before I even flip it the first time, but I wanted to make a couple of observations about the mold. Um, how well that is showing up, but when I took the cheese out I noticed that there was a blank area that didn't have the nice pattern on the cheese and then when I was washing this uh, I noticed that uh, there's a, a right side up and a wrong side up and I had it the wrong way around. You see this about an inch and a half or so up here that doesn't have the weave. That should have been on the top and I had it on the bottom. So when the press was pressing the curd down below, it uh, lost that much of the, of the nice weave pattern. And I have this blank space on the bottom. It won't affect the flavor or anything of the cheese. It just won't look the way it was intended to look. And the next time I do this, hopefully I'll remember that there is a right side up and a wrong side up. And the other observation that I wanted to make was about the mold itself. I noticed only one comment um, on the uh, website, the cheesemaking.com website when I bought it, and it was a favorable comment. The person really liked the mold. Their only criticism was that it was difficult to clean. Well, I didn't find it difficult to clean at all. The, the uh, cheese came out of it completely. There wasn't anything stuck to it. And My thought is, they didn't say whether or not they used cheesecloth, but my thought is possibly they didn't use cheesecloth on the first pressing and the little holes that I talked about in the side of the mold got plugged. Um, if you left that aside for a while after you took the cheese out, they would be very hard to get cleaned out of there. But I didn't find any problem at all. I really liked the mold and if I'd understood that there was a right side and a wrong side up, I'd have a cheese that looked the way it was supposed to look. So I'll bring you back when I take this out of the brine. There's my sourdough loaf made with cheese whey, just out of the oven, piping hot. Smells good. I'm going to cut it in two and try a slice after it's completely cooled. I think it expanded better. It, uh, whether the whey had anything to do with that or not, I don't know. Usually I cut a cross in the top, and this time I, I cut a circle. So that's why there's sort of a little darker top hat sitting there. So if that made it rise more or if the whey made it rise more, I don't know. But looking forward to trying it. Well, it's almost completely cool. I'll cut it in half and see what we've got here. It's a multi-grain loaf. I really think that did rise better than, than it does with water. With the whey. Cut a slice and see what I think of it, I guess. I like the piece with the most crust. A bit of butter. It certainly has that very good 
sourdough flavor. Can't say as I taste anything that's different as far as the whey being in there. But it made a nice lighter loaf. It seemed to, to rise better, so I think I would probably do that again. Well, I just took it out of the brine, and if you can see what I mean there, I was trying to explain the plain area down here is because I had that mold liner thing in upside down. Something I'll have to try to remember the next time so that I get a pretty weave all over it. I've patted it dry somewhat with paper towels, which is what it tells you to do. Now take a, a knife and remove that extra bit there. And now it gets covered with just cheesecloth to prevent you know, dust or a fly or anything getting on it. And it gets left out at room temperature for two or three days until it's dry, completely dry to the touch. Guess that's that. And it says during that time it should uh, change color a bit, darken a bit, so it turns more of a cream color. So I'll bring you back in two or three days' time after it has finished drying. My cheese is just about ready to start the aging process. It's been drying for three days, and I'm going to try to do a natural rind. And I just wanted to show you a couple of photographs of what it could possibly look like. I think this one has been aged much longer than mine it will be. Mine will only be done for two months. And it's got quite a black surface on it. And I don't know how long this one has been aged, but it's more of a gray surface. As I'm putting my cheese in the aging box and showing it to you in just a few minutes, I'll explain how this happens. Well, there it is. It's had almost three days of drying and it's very dry to the touch and now it's going to go into an aging box, an aging container. Uh, it'll be stored at 52 to 54 degrees which is the temperature that I currently have my uh, cheese cave fridge running at. The uh, lovely colors that you just saw pictures that I found on the internet of Monchego cheese. The color depends on how long the cheese has been aged and as near as I've been able to find out uh, they sort of sell it in three different or four different age categories 60 days, 90 days or a, up to a full year for a, a three, I guess that's three different classifications isn't it, for a fully aged cheese and I'm going to go with uh, uh, the 60 days, two months, so I don't really know what color to expect the thing to turn into. But the method is, uh, rather than brushing off the mold, you rub the mold into the cheese. So as mold forms, periodically you take the cheese and rub olive oil on the surface. And that spreads the, the mold around and also sort of seals it from the air. Um, and you sh I should get some kind of a color, somewhere between gray to black. And they say that the mold is perfectly the surface, the, the rind that forms is perfectly edible, so that isn't a problem either. And it ages at uh, 85 to 90 percent humidity. And when I put the lid on and close this up and put it away, that will go eventually close to 90 percent. At least that's what happened with my, uh, I guess it was the... Edom cheese that I was uh, did this to for a while. Yeah, before I before I put the wax coating on. Um, some of these cheeses are sold that look sort of a blonde, yellowish surface on them, and that's because the mold on those is still a natural rind, but the mold was brushed off. But the more traditional method is to um, keep the mold, rub it in, and, and periodically put a coating of olive oil on the surface. So. This is where I'm going to conclude the video, but I will do some tiny little short clips, minute or two, over the next two months and, and put them up to 
hopefully show that I'm having some success. And as you might have noticed, I, one thing I'm doing different this time is I bought a box of food service gloves, gloves that people use in the restaurant uh, business that don't want to get their you know, contaminate anything with their hands. They're not powder treated or anything. They're a plastic, not latex. But I don't want to add anything from my hands on the surface of the cheese. So I'm going to uh, use a pair of these every time I open it to turn it. And I will be turning the cheese almost daily. Um, every day or every couple of days during the process. So. At some point in a few weeks time, I hope to show you where I've got mold growing and it's not going to be a total disaster like my Tom cheese was. I'm, I'm, th I'm feeling pretty, pretty good about this one. It's a nice solid cheese. I know it got the right uh, amount of, of pressure when it was being pressed. So. Well, thank you very much for watching and I'll get this up on the internet.